and so more fun here with Gravity's Rainbow. Uh, now, before we get into this next episode, which is uh, part one, episode two, um, which continues with this character of Pirate Prentice, um, I'd like to actually uh, have a little bit of fun. I recall um, when we were talking yesterday about uh, Sagittarius being, uh, and the novel opens under the sign of Sagittarius on December 18th, uh, which is the primordial rocket hurler, uh, the centaur who is firing a rocket out into space. Basically, it's a... It's a an arrow is a primordial rocket, um, and that character uh, is based on an older, Mesop way older Mesopotamian character named Pabelsag, who was a hunter, um, who was actually half man, half lion. Uh, so that's a very, very old uh, astrological sign, Sagittarius is. But it is the archer. And I remember that um, my grandfather was a rocket scientist uh, in the 1950s. He was part of the whole space age, uh, aerospace uh, development going on out in the southwest, uh, moving back and forth between California, Arizona, and New Mexico, uh, building rockets uh, for the military. I have one of his papers here called A Proposal for Rocket Heads Containing Small Missiles. Uh, and this is dated June of 1953, uh, and it's marked confidential. It's a military document here. He was working on trying to design um, a, uh, a rockets uh, that could carry missiles in the tip of them. Uh, basically a, a mechanized arrow, a fancy high industrial civilizational mechanized arrow. And he too was a Sagittarius, uh, not surprisingly. And when I pulled up his birth chart, I looked at it. Not only was he a Sagittarius, but he had uh, <clears throat> Sun conjunct Saturn, uh, conjunct Mars, conjunct Mercury, all overlapping with Sagittarius and Scorpio. Uh, very strong smart intellect regarding the physical world. Mars is the physical world. Saturn is precisional thinking. Mercury is the intellect. And there we have the sun uh, with the rocket archetype in Sagittarius. And this stellium is trined by Jupiter conjunct Uranus in Pisces, which is interesting because uh, Jupiter is the thunderbolt hurler. He also hurls rockets, and Jupiter rules Sagittarius. Uh, and not only that, but Uranus has to do with not only technology, but also with the principle of breakthroughs. And so somebody with Jupiter conjunct Uranus could very well be uh, a rocket scientist uh, who uh, is responsible for creating breakthroughs in the realm of, uh, of rocket science, uh, rocketry. So uh, astrology never lies. Um, and here he is. Here's a picture of the, of the dude with, uh, in a science journal. This is uh, International Science and Technology from the 1950s. And here he is standing to the left there with sunglasses with his uh, atmospheric rocket that he designed called the Judy, um, which is the French name, by the way, for Thursday, um, which is another, Thor is another missile hurler with his hammer. Um, and there he is. And that rocket is in the, the Smithsonian, uh, to the best of my knowledge, anyway. So that's the dude. Um, so interesting. Um, now what I want to do then is I want to go over some of the semiotics that I didn't have time to go into in the previous video, because it was getting very long, um, <clears throat> regarding the way in which von Braun conceived of the rocket as his dream, as a romantic, lifelong, escapist fantasy of basically traveling across the Rainbow Bridge, Bifrost, as it's called in German uh, Scandinavian mythology. Bifrost is, is the Rainbow Bridge that the gods use to walk across, and you can see this in some of the recent superhero movies, uh, that the gods use to walk across to get to uh, Valhalla. And basically, that's what Von Braun wanted to do. Um, he was a kind of modern incarnation of Phelan the Smith, uh, but who wanted to uh, create rockets as a human conveyance for traveling across Bifrost uh, to the other world, to the heavens. But that vector was deflected by Hitler, who bent the rainbow bridge in the direction of gravity's rainbow into a parabolic arch, where, whereby he wanted to use the rocket as basically a mechanized sphere uh, and essentially an immunological defense against the firebombings of all the German cities that the Allies had been doing, and use it to hurl against the exoskeletal covering of the polosphere of London, crack it open, and get to the tender white human meat on the inside, just like eagles uh, that have the practice of taking turtles up and dropping them on rocks to shatter their shells so they can get at the tender white meat on the inside. And so Hitler was really wanted to use the rocket. He had no romantic escapist fantasies about going off to other worlds. He wanted to use the rocket as a weapon, uh, not as a drumospheric conveyance. 
But I think the Allies, the Americans in particular, uh, shared von Braun's idealism and took this over and re-territorialized the rocket from a kind of Paleolithic sphere to a Neolithic habitation for the human being. Let's put the human being on the inside of the rocket and transform his environment so that uh, the rocket then becomes a dromospheric extension of the polosphere into a being outside the world, um, whereupon artificial habitations, uh, and here it moves from the Paleolithic now to the Neolithic, which is the age of habitations, um, and the rocket becomes the bridge uh, when the Americans get hold of it and get a hold of Von Braun, they're capturing a Veland the Smith. Uh, then uh, it becomes this idea of a, of a, dromos a, a dromospheric conveyance into outer space for human habitations and world building. Um, so the semiotics were very different uh, between what Hitler uh, and his crew were envisaging the usage of the rocket as versus what Von Braun was thinking of it as. Um, I also want to draw the contrast uh, between Pynchon's first novel, V, uh, V1, uh, let's say, uh, and Gravity's Rainbow could, could have been called V2. Um, but um, in V, the semiotics are that the V represents the uh, pubic triangle or the vagina of the great mother, the goddess. That image, that glyph is as old as the Paleolithic, that inscription, uh, but it's largely, she comes to flower during the Neolithic, which is the great age of the worship of uh, goddesses uh, under the sign, let's say, of Cancer, which figures in somewhere, 5,000 or 6,000 B.C., somewhere in there, which is the age of domestication and the great mother and uh, the what I call the metaphysical vulva, where, which spontaneously gives birth to, without the need for insemination by a male. Whereas uh, V2, on the other hand, Gravity's Rainbow, deals with... Um, the mechanization of the Indo-Aryans uh, and their sky gods, who were all thunder hurlers, all the Indo-Aryans and Indo-Europeans uh, from the Persians going all the way across to the Celts, all had thunder hurling sky gods that came in. These guys were masters of the horse, going back as far as 5000 BC, where the horse, as far as we know, was first domesticated in Eastern Europe between the Black and uh, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And eventually they came down on these goddess-worshipping societies, uh, as Maria Gambutis used to talk about. They came down, uh, horseback riders on these goddess-worshipping societies as these nomads, uh, and invaded them. And the nomad, uh, like the astronaut, carries civilization with him and makes it portable. Um, McLuhan used to say that the rocket obsolesces uh, the wheel because it decouples the dromosphere from the first time from the, the geolithic sphere, and it creates its own roads. And in doing so, it also packs up civilization into component parts on its inside. We think during the Apollo mission of the moon rover, this conveyance, this artificial car that's folded up on the inside of the rocket, or the moon lander that brings it down, which is also folded up on the inside of the rocket. And so the astronaut takes civilization with him wherever he goes and makes it portable and can land in a hostile landscape and unpack it and start creating a being in the world within that landscape. Same thing with Vikings. Uh, the Vikings did not have cities. Uh, they left, and they took their cities with them in their boats. And so wherever they went, they could unpack Viking civilization, which they did with the cities when they founded the Russian cities of Kiev and Novgorod. They simply unpacked Viking society, which was made modular by the dromosphere conveyances of their boats. Um, and the same thing with the Bedouin. The Bedouin, uh, on his camel, travels across smooth space and also makes his civilization portable, packs it up, and wherever he goes, he can unpack his tents, and there's his world right there. And so uh, the rocket eventually does make civilization portable into the exosphere, into a being outside of the world, which can then unfold uh, civilization within hostile landscapes. And so that's the contrast between the semiotics of V, uh, Pynchon's first novel, which has to do with uh, the Neolithic great mother and the mystery of this woman, V, uh, v for vagina, and for her name, every time her name comes up, it's a different V name, but Vanessa the Rat, Veronica, or Veronica the Rat, Vanessa, um, Veronica Wren, or whatever, all these V names that are associated with her as the great mother and her mystery versus uh, Gravity's Rainbow, or V2, in which we have uh, the great indo uh, sky god and the transition from one world age to the next, the, the rocket, is the dromospheric conveyance uh, that translated modernist civilization over the catastrophe and chasm and chisura of World War II into post-modernity 
and to the uh, exportation of uh, the space age out around the planet to form an exoskeleton for the first time around the planet. With the space age, with Werner von Braun's rockets and then um, Howard Hughes's uh, satellites, uh, the Earth becomes surrounded with an exoskeleton of human technology for the first time. The planet is placed on the inside of technology and has not escaped from it yet, but it's in process of melting it down. It won't last. Um, <clears throat> the Great Mother cannot be imprisoned for very long by Indo uh, the Indo-Aryan appropriation of the metaphysical vulva into the paternal vulva with aggression from the power using the word. Okay, so that's what I had to say uh, by way of preface to this second episode, which I think is quite funny, uh, as most of these chapters are, that continues with uh, Pirate Prentice's Morning. And Pirate Prentice, as I said before, is named after a character in the Pirates of Penzance. I forget the character's name, but the, the woman who raised him uh, accidentally uh, made a mistake, and she, she tells the guy, he ends up becoming a pirate, this character, and she says, no, I wanted him to be the apprentice of a pilot, not a, pro a pirate, uh, so it's based on uh, the fact that this character becomes Pirate Apprentice uh, is, is uh, very amusing, based on a, a, a mishearing of a word. Um, and so the morning continues here uh, with Pirate Apprentice making breakfast. And, and the atmosphere here is very much like the opening chapter of Ulysses, and I think that Pynchon is, is very much dialoguing with that opening chapter where Stephen Dedalus, uh, together with his two friends, are uh, waking up and having breakfast in their uh, the, the gun turret thing that they've re-territorialized as a house. The same thing here, a bunch of guys wake up, all these special ops guys, they wake up, and Pynchon has fun with uh, describing all the different ways that Pirate Prentice can fry bananas. All these different kind of banana casseroles, banana fried bananas, for this, that, the other thing, which is a little puzzling at first until you remind yourself that this is uh, a characteristic of epics. It's called cataloging. All the great epics do this. Uh, in uh, Homer's Iliad, he catalogs all the ships. You have to spend there page after page after page of him describing what ship came where from what island and who was in it. Uh, same thing with Milton, who emulates this in Paradise Lost when he describes all the, uh, the demons that have fallen down into the realm of hell and the building of Pandemonium. And he describes every single one of them, which is a retrieval of all the pagan deities. Um, here, Pynchon does this throughout the text, consciously writing, I think, an epic, where he knows that this is an epic characteristic cataloging things. Um, and so we get a sort of mock epic here with the cataloging of these different ways of frying up bananas. And he actually has a character, Teddy Bloat, slip on a banana peel just for fun. Uh, and they're singing merry songs uh, that are absolutely uh, ridiculous. And the spirit of, of this book is very jovial, uh, very much like Joyce's Comic Spirit and Finnegan's Wake, which is one of the funniest books ever. I think this is also one of the funniest books ever written. Uh, but you've got to tune in to Pynchon's sense of humor. It's, it's very funny. Uh, but it's a very jovial book all, all the way throughout, and a lot of merrymaking as it goes along. And so Pirate Prentison receives a call. And uh, this is the motif that Campbell calls the call to adventure. Um, so he receives a call from his superior officer who tells him, well, uh, you know that uh, rocket... Uh, that you saw coming in this morning, and we never heard the explosion. So, uh, it landed at Greenwich, uh, near the Royal Observatory, and there's mail in it for you. Uh, which is ironic because uh, in the previous episode, Pirate Prentice had seen the rocket coming and had said to himself, incoming mail, which is a phrase uh, normally used for uh, incoming ordnance. Uh, it's called incoming mail. But yet, in this case, it actually turned out, turned out to be literally true. The rocket apparently did not have a, an explosive on it and was used as a dromospheric conveyance for messages. Landed near uh, the Royal Observatory, which note is on zero degree longitude. So there's the zero again that we're going to get beyond. Pynchon has promised us we're going to get beyond the zero, but he starts us with the zero uh, in this chapter. And also the code, I, I noticed looking this up on Wikipedia for the Royal Observatory is triple zero, uh, which is interesting later. There's a mysterious rocket near the end of the narrative, the rocket quintuple zero five zeros uh, that is launched actually with a person inside of it as a human sacrifice and part of the, the Germanic uh, Scandinavian death cult that gets mixed in with the science here. Um, and so he says, okay, I'll be right over to go check it out. So then we're with Pirate Prentice as he's on his merry way. He's driving a, what is it, a Lagonda, some sort of, and it's a green car that he's traveling along through London merrily on his way to Greenwich. 
And then he starts musing, and, and Pynchon tells us that Pirate Prentice has a special ability, and many of his characters have psychic abilities. And Pirate Prentice's ability is that he can he can become what's called a surrogate fantasist, although I've never heard of this in real life. But he can uh, experience other people's fantasies for them, especially the people that he works for in special ops, so that he can take over their daydreaming for them and do it vicariously. I think this is quite funny. So that they can then do their work. Uh, so he picks up the slack for their fantasies. Meanwhile, that enables them more efficiently, less entropically, to do their work. And so one of the fantasies that, that he does uh, is this guy whose name I've forgotten. It's a funny name. One of the one of his co-workers who has a fantasy. His name is uh, Lord ba Lord Blatherard Osmo. Who has this fantasy about an adenoid, and an adenoid is connected to the the sinuses. It's a, I looked it up. It's, back, it's behind the tonsils, and it's connected to the, the sinuses. And so um, Prentice has uh, lives this guy's fantasy for him, where he's out and he encounters a giant adenoid that just keeps getting larger and larger and larger until it uh, achieves Godzilla scale proportions. And indeed, I think Pynchon here is dialoguing with the Godzilla movies, which he he loves. He, he's been known to wear Godzilla T-shirts. Uh, people have said. He loves Godzilla, and here he's playing in Godzilla's footprint. Uh, remember, does turn up in Vineland, as I recall, uh, in in Japan they find his footprint. And so we get this uh, treatment of his making fun of the giant, the 1950s uh, giant monster movies, um, and they're throwing rockets at it. They're they're throw, or whatever it is, bombs, electricity. They're trying to electrocute it, and this adenoid is stomping around London, uh, stomping everything down. And finally, the only way that they can uh, tame it is by uh, Dr. Freud's method, recall that Freud was addicted to cocaine, of bringing in massive amounts of cocaine, and they carry them up ladders, and they throw it at the adenoid uh, to stone it, basically make it uh, and calm it down. And finally, it gets so stoned on the cocaine, or high rather, on the cocaine that, uh, that it's neutralized. And so that's, uh, uh, I find all of that hysterically funny. I was laughing all the way through it, reading it here again for the second time. So that's what I have to say about episode two of part one of Thomas Pynchon's masterpiece, Gravity's Rainbow.